Yeah, we'll edit that later. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, everyone, for coming um, to this session of the Oxford Jurisprudence Discussion Group. Um, before we begin, I just want to uh, let everyone know that next week we have two events. Um, one on Wednesday with uh, Chris Mammon, who is coming from the U.S. and is going to speak on originalism in the U.S. constitutional cases. And on Thursday, we have David Dyson House. Okay? So Dyson House is going to happen here, as usual. Uh, Chris Mammon's talk on Wednesday is going to happen in the main quad ballroom. It's really easy to find uh, over there at UNIT. Um, it will be explained in tomorrow's email and on Twitter. Okay, um, so today we have with us uh, Michael Foran, who is a lecturer in public law in the University of Glasgow and holds a PhD uh, from the University uh, from, from Cambridge. And the title of his paper is The Rule of Law and Human Flourishing. So, uh, Michael, you could explain to us the paper in around 30 minutes or so, and then we'll open it to the Q&A. Uh, thank you very much for coming to the JDG, Michael. Thank you for uh, having floor me. Yours. Well, thank you. So yes, I think I'll start obviously by, by, by thanking you for the invitation. It's really very kind. Um, and also by uh, presenting a bit of a caveat here, which is that um, I haven't looked at this paper in about a year and a half until this morning. So um, <laughs> I'm not sure how well we're going to, to, to do it this, but I think we'll be all right. Um, this is very much a, a, a work in progress. I wrote the paper and I wasn't happy with it, so I've kind of shelved it. Um, and I've come back to it now, so um, if you do have any thoughts or comments or criticism, please do feel free to, to send it. Um, yeah, so I'll just maybe just jump into the, the content of the paper and see if we can get a discussion going as a part of it. And then what I'll start by doing is maybe setting out the, the underlying motivation for the paper, which to me comes from kind of a central question that I've been grappling, which is why these principles of the rule of law. So we've got all these different theories of the rule of law that tend to coalesce around a certain list of principles or desiderata. Um, so Fuller is the, the classic example, but Joseph Raz has also had uh, a similar list. And, and, and the central question that I've been trying to grapple with is, well, why those? Um, and relatedly, um, does the reason why we have those principles tell us something about how we're supposed to assess compliance with the principles? So it's one thing to have a list of principles of the, what the rule of law entails. It's another thing to figure out what constitutes compliance with or breach of those principles. And I'm wondering that the central question I've been getting at is, um, does the reason why we have picked that list in particular tell us anything about how we're supposed to assess compliance with the rule of law in general? There's also a secondary theme that I've been kind of grappling with as a part of this, which is uh, picking up on some of the work that John Gardner um, did on, on, on Fuller's work towards the end of his life, um, which was asking whether or not we've been wrong to describe Lon Fuller as someone who advocates for a formal or a procedural conception of the rule of law. Um, and relatedly to that, my interest is whether or not there's a connection between Fuller's theory of the rule of law and what we might call the classical natural law tradition. Um, the central theme that is kind of drawing out from that is within Fuller's work, the description that Fuller has of the internal morality of law as predominantly aspirational in nature. And so what I'm trying to get at is uh, what that means. Um, and one point to say about Fuller, I, I, I'm a big fan of Fuller. I think Fuller is a, an intellectual hero of mine. But um, Fuller has a tendency to have these kind of sparks of insight that lacks a level of depth in analysis that results in a difficulty in figuring out precisely how to cash out what those insights actually are. Um, and I don't know if that's a, a feature of the kind of project that he was doing. I think Fuller is predominantly a scholar who was trying to look at the connections between different concepts rather than to kind of dig down into what differentiates particular concepts. And that latter approach is far more akin to how analytical jurisprudence operates and, and um, analytical philosophy as well. And Fuller seems to be doing something slightly different there. So what I want to kind of get as a, as a background point about what I think these core insights are and then work out how do we manifest them um, in terms of maybe trying to add a bit more flesh to those bones. Uh, the first one is that I think Fuller is right to indicate that a well-functioning legal order is a public good. That is something that is good for society generally. And um, secondly, ensuring that this legal order functions well requires what Fuller describes as excellence in legality. And I think that's true, but again, an insight that we want to dig a little bit deeper on. 
Um, thirdly, that this excellence in legality entails adopting an appropriate attitude of respect towards the legal subject. And this is something that I think both um, Fuller and, Laz, and Raz in his later writings have, have both agreed on. Um, and what kind of stems from this appropriate attitude, I think the first one is what Fuller has repeatedly referred to as the conception of man inherent in legality. And again, I'd like to dig into that a little bit. And then secondly, this conception of reciprocity that he has within his work as well. So the claim that I want to push in this paper is that these insights push us towards the idea that the rule of law is underpinned by a commitment to custodianship of some kind, that government works for the best interests of the governed. Um, and that will require, I think, some conception of human flourishing to understand what the best interests of the governed are. So that's the central claim that I want to get at, that the rule of law is in some sense connected to an ideal of custodianship. Custodianship is tied to the best interests of the governed. The best interests of the governed require us to think a little bit more deeply about the concept of human flourishing and how that then feeds into this concept. So, Starting with Fuller's eight desiderata, um, some, uh, most notably Professor Matthew Kramer at Cambridge, have argued that these principles represent what we might call content-independent threshold existence, uh, existence conditions for a legal system. Um, and what he means by that is that we can identify what uh, a legal system is by reference to these desiderata without having to think about the nature of the legal system, the content of the norms that exist within the legal system. And then separately, Kramer thinks that there's also an ideal embedded in that, that if you're in a particularly good legal system, you, these principles then attach on and provide some kind of guidance towards what might constitute excellence in legality. And I think Matt's work is, is, is the best on this framework of, um, of identifying compliance with the rule of law by reference to what we might call a, a quantitative assessment. We're trying to figure out how much of these particular desiderata are in order for us to meet a threshold of existence, and then we can think about what happens beyond that. Um, the worst of uh, that kind of framework are these kinds of rule of law index uh, <laughs> things where uh, an economist tries to run um, a, a, a quant analysis and to um, identify how many laws there are that engage with A, B, or C, or whether or not we've got sufficient independence of the judiciary. And then from there, we can give a rating to a state as to whether or not it's compliant with the, the rule of law. So that's one way of, of, of thinking about how we would comply with the requirements of the rule of law. But to Fuller, these principles are not simply or even primarily concerned with threshold existence conditions. Rather, they constitute what he refers to as an aspirational ideal, which serve as to quote Fuller, distinct standards by which excellence in legality may be tested. And I think this is also the uh, approach that's adopted by Raz as well. So I don't think this is just somebody who's concerned with natural law theory would be um, interested in understanding the rule of law in this way. So Raz stresses that while conformity with the rule of law is often a matter of degree, quote, it is not meant that the degree of conformity can be quantitatively measured by counting the number of infringements or some such method. So what that leads us to is the idea that there must be something common to these desiderata which makes them one doctrine rather than a hodgepodge of disparate principles. And so what we need then is some kind of theoretical account to explain this. This is what Raz uh, adopted in his uh, early work on the rule of law is in attempting to do that. And it's also, I argue, what Fuller was trying to do. And I think the best way to explain how this works um, is to see how the rule of law affects the ends that we could pursue through law or through governance. And so the example that I want to use is an example that Raz himself uh, identified in his early and his later work, but which is also useful as a general description, if anybody is thinking about what could, could constitute a breach of the rule of law, which is the misuse of public funds. So Raz's example, they always like to bring in Rex, so we'll bring Rex in at this point. So let's say we have a hereditary monarch named Rex, who is using the public purse to purchase an expensive diamond ring for his lover. Um, Raz thinks that this is a breach of the rule of law. Uh, Fuller would say the exact same, and I agree. Um, and the reason why Raz thinks this is a breach of the rule of law is because the, the monarch here has failed to adequately distinguish the rights and powers of government from the rights and powers of private owners. Even though he controls the public purse, um, he does not own it. So a core insight here is that what constitutes a breach of the rule of law is what we might call the privatization of a public good, the use 
of public funds or a public good for private ends. But if that's true, and I think it is, um, that creates a problem for Raz, um, because he can't have it both ways. He can't say that the rule of law is both a valuable moral ideal concerned with the proper ends of government, i.e. public goods versus private goods, public ends versus private ends, and also that it's a content-neutral tool that's indifferent to how government power is wielded. And I think Raz recognized this because towards the end of his, his life and his career, he wrote um, a new paper on the rule of law restating his theory, which I think engaged in quite a lot of changes to the core theoretical framework that he has for the rule of law. And in that new analysis, he attempts to avoid a fully moral count of the rule of law by tying these notions to what he refers to as the very notion of government such that demanding adherence to them takes no sides on the ends of government and as such is no more than insisting that it should act as a government. That's his claim, is that we can still have this idea of the misuse of public funds, but I'm not asking, I'm not talking about what the government should do, I'm just saying just act like a government. But I don't, I don't think this can succeed, and part of the reason why I don't think it can succeed is because if you tie legality to the notion of governance, so if you tie compliance with the rule of law to the, to the very notion of governance itself, that's only tenable in this context if governance equates with rule of law compliant governance. Um, so any other kind of governance that's not rule of law compliant would not be true governance. Um, that's a position I'm more than happy to accept, but I don't think Raz would have been happy to have accepted it because quite a lot of his career has been built around the argument that the rule of law is a distinct political ideal that is separate from governance qua governance. And in fact, a government could still be a government and a legal system without having the rule of law. So I don't think he can tie this idea both to the rule of law and to the idea of governance without fusing the rule of law and governance together. Um, secondly, I, I think it's clearly not remaining neutral on the ends of government either. Um, so the, if the rule of law tells us how government might proceed by law, and if we accept that, then the use of public means for private ends, if we accept that as a part of uh, the rule of law, then that means we now have two categories of the ends of government. We have public ends and we have private ends. Um, and we say the rule of law directs the government to pursue ends that are public and to avoid pursuing ends that are private. Um, and if you do that, you now have to determine what those categories entail. And when you figure out what those categories entail, you figure out the ends that governments are permitted to pursue if they want to be rule of law compliant and the ends that they're not permitted to pursue if they want to be rule of law compliant. So I don't think you can tie these ideas to the rule of law without also tying them to the ends that governments can properly pursue. So what does that leave us with? Then we have to think about how we think about these principles again, not tied to some qualitative assessment of a threshold conception, but to what we might call principled compliance. So we assess compliance with the rule of law by reference to some unifying rationale or principle that gives these, um, these disparate principles a unifying core. And so both Fuller and Raz, although they just agreed on the connection between the rule of law and legal validity, or the existence of a legal system itself, they both embraced what you could call a normatively grounded conception of the ideal of the rule of law that is tied to a specific unifying rationale. Um, and both of them referred to these uh, initially in their, in their work by reference to the ideal of action guidance, that that's the thing that unifies the rule of law, that the purpose of the rule of law, its end, what it's good for, is to help guide conduct in some way. Now, Fuller, interestingly, attempts to problematize these desiderata throughout the entirety of his writing on this. Um, so you go back and look at the morality of law, that second chapter, which is usually the only chapter that anybody reads from that book. Um, but if you, if, you, if you look at that chapter, he starts off in the first maybe two pages setting out the desiderata, and then the next 30 pages are explaining why it's actually really difficult to figure out what compliance with each of them will require. Um, and the best example of this, I think, is the principle of retroactivity, where he starts off by saying, you know, on the face of it, a retroactive law is an abomination. But if we think a little bit deeper, there are some circumstances where retroactive laws are not only permissible, but required by the rule of law. And if that's the case, then you can't just say retroactivity qua retroactivity constitutes a breach of the rule of law, because sometimes the rule of law requires a retroactive law or retroactive regimes. Um, so Fuller is already problematizing that conception. Um, 
And so we're, we're left with, with, with something else here that we have to think about. So, so both Fuller and Raz adopt uh, an account of compliance with the rule of law, which focuses on the capacity of legal norms to guide the behavior of subjects. And I think that's captured an important aspect of the rule of law, but it's, it's, it's not sufficient. And I think Raz recognized that as well. So there's arguably another, I think, more foundational and I think equally as important grounding for the rule of law, which is what Fuller refers to as this conception of man inherent in legality. And what he means by that is that, that, that people, citizens, legal subjects, are moral agents who are capable of guiding their conduct by reference to rules. They're not rocks. Um, and the fact that they are moral agents capable of guiding their conduct according to rules tells us something about how rule of law compliant governance should conceive of the legal subject. So that, that's been pretty, pretty long established. Um, and Jeremy Waldron has drawn on this conception to advance the claim, arguably, I think, implicit in Fuller's own analysis, that fidelity to the ideal of legality can protect human dignity in some sense. Um, this is your given status, the dignity of the rights bearer, or the dignity of the legal subject who's capable of bringing legal claims, who's capable and, and, and able to um, follow rules that are given. But all of that presupposes something about the moral agency of the legal subject, and when that moral agency is respected in the way that the rule of law requires, there's some kind of protection for dignity going on there. Again, that's all been, uh, broadly speaking, argued already. Um, but I think there are important implications of this dignity that have gone unrecognized. And that's the, the focus that I want to um, approach in this paper. So Raz's initial identification of this normative core of the rule of law with the idea that, and again, this is a quote, in the final analysis, the doctrine rests on its basic idea that law should be capable of providing effective guidance. The principles do not stand on their own they must be consistently interpreted in light of this basic idea. And I think he's right that the principles must be interpreted in light of a basic idea. But I'm not sure that action guidance is the basic idea that these principles are unified around. And so the requirement of effective guidance then uh, does not fully account for the normative underpinning of the rule of law in my view, um, because I don't think it can fully explain the purpose of the rule of law. And again, Braz accepted this in his updated account of the rule of law, where he recognizes the incompleteness of this guidance-based account. And so he says, and again, apologies, this is a quote, um, people can plan and organize their affairs on the basis of partial information and in the face of risk. The law itself, however, clear in language and even in the absence of discretion in interpreting, applying, or modifying it, generates uncertainties and risk. So on occasion, the law deliberately adopts rules that generate uncertainty and risk. We must conclude that while the law aims to guide, its ability to do so is much less securely connected with the rule of law principles I, he enumerated than is often assumed. I think he's right on that. Um, but what he does to get around this new problem is something that could potentially collapse his entire positivist framework of the rule of law. Maybe not his entire positivist framework of law generally, but certainly of the rule of law. Because his new account is tied to a conception of governance such that and I quote, acting for a purpose that is clearly not one that governments are entitled to pursue offends against the rule of law. And as such, drawing upon standards of legitimacy, he argues that conformity with the rule of law, quote, requires that government action will manifest an intention to protect and advance the interests of the governed. Now, I think he's entirely right on that, but that's going to leave quite a lot to answer if you think that the rule of law is a content neutral, independent ideal. Um, that could equally be served for good or ill ends. So, while he leaves the idea of government as custodian somewhat underdefined, I think this idea begins to capture and reflect the image of the legal subject that the rule of law presupposes. So the rule of law manifests a requirement to adopt an appropriate attitude towards legal subjects, one which embodies both what Fuller referred to as the morality of duty and the morality of aspiration. So I'm going to focus on the aspiration aspect for this talk. The paper goes into the morality of duty, but broadly speaking, that's all the arguments that you hear about the rule of law in some way being connected to rights protection. Um, that's duty, that's the duty aspect of this, which is that the govern a government that breaches the fundamental rights of its subjects or its citizens um, in somehow breaches a duty that it has inherent in the ideal or the requirement to abide by the rule of law. 
that's also been argued a lot. Um, John Gardner put forward some very compelling claims, and I myself have tried to build on that in some of my previous work. So what I want to focus on now is the morality of aspiration as an aspect of this. This attitude manifesting something like a requirement to pursue excellence in legality. So analysis of the rule of law often focuses on what we could call the consequences that result from adherence to it. Um, and this is things like how it will create stability or it will be able to ensure that people can live their, um, their lives in accordance with stable rules, they can plan, all of that kind of stuff. But I think the central insight that Fuller grasped that uh, these was that these outcomes are actually ancillary to the attitude that must be adopted by those in authority if they wish to rule through law. It's the attitude first that then helps lead to these outcomes. And Fuller's original um, insight here is that the principles of legality are best conceived not as threshold conditions, but as principles of excellence in governance. And if you combine that with Raz's more expansive normative core of custodianship, I think this reveals a connection arguably pre present within Fuller's own writings between the rule of law and the idea of the flourishing of the legal subject. And so concern for autonomy is never sufficient to ground the kind of relationship that's envisaged by the rule of law. Because to adhere to excellence in legality, um, legal officials must strive to be good custodians. So they're not merely content to set up a system of rules and entitlements and let people have at it. They have to actively ensure that this system genuinely benefits the legal subject. So that's where we see this connection between excellence in legality and human flourishing, at least on my view. So the morality of duty here, these rights-based accounts, um, constitute what I would see as the bare minimum requirements below which n the government is not permitted to fall. But in contrast, the morality of aspiration is not about rights or principles of right action or something like that. It's about the good. It is, to quote Fuller, uh, the morality of the good life, of excellence, of the fullest realization of human potential. It is grounded in the firm realization that a person or a citizen or an official may fail to live up to their potential and may be found wanting. So crucially, what Fuller says is that this is not the case that the official is condemned for failure. Um, they're, they're, they are condemned for failure, but they're condemned not for being recreant in duty, but for shortcoming, not for wrongdoing. So if that's true, and we can see legality as some kind of aspiration towards excellence in custodianship, um, we then have to ask, what does that look like? How do we, how do we make sense of that? And Fuller, I think, clearly believed that there was an ideal of excellence in legality which was inherent within the concept of law. And I think Raz and others can quibble about whether or not the rule of law is tied to the concept of law or anything like that. If we just talk about the rule of law in more general, we can have other fights at different times about whether or not rule of law compliance is necessary for a legal system to be a legal system or necessary for the validity of legal norms. Let's just try and talk about the rule of law as a concept itself. But then if we say, okay, well, whatever is meant by perfection in legality, it cannot be fully understood in abstraction from this underlying normative core that unifies these principles into a coherent doctrine. So again, I think we must reject the idea that excellence in legality aspires for something like perfect action guidance. Um, you know, we respect the agency of the individual or the separateness of persons um, as an essential aspect of the rule of law, but it's not enough. Um, I think too much focus has been placed on agency, and far too little has been focused on the attitude of the of respect that demands recognition of human agency in the first place. So, the principle of legality, again, quoting Fuller here, is to to meet these demands, human energies must be directed towards specific kinds of achievement and not merely warned away from harmful acts. And so, as such, the rule of law appeals to what we refer to as a sense of custodianship or trusteeship. It's the pride of the craftsman um, on behalf of the lawgiver. And in this sense, um, trusteeship or custodianship, this is what grounds and justifies how we're supposed to measure excellence in legality, in my view. So Fuller may therefore be mistaken to have spent so much of his time focusing on the capacity of law to guide human conduct. Um, because it clearly means that a more foundational end is at play here, which is the end of achieving this excellence in legality, 
and advancing the interests of those under one's charge, this custodianship idea. And so I think the, the, the way of framing this is to say that law is a form of social ordering. It's intimately connected to the idea of community, and community, whatever else it might be, is a form of unifying relationship between persons. It's not just about the separate agency that we have, but the moral connectedness as well. So we're not just separate persons, we are also deeply connected. And that connectedness forms an important aspect of our flourishing. And that's where we get community and legal systems and the rule of law to begin with. So excellence in legality then is achieved where this form of social ordering is grounded not on mutual exploitation, but on genuine civic friendship, where legal officials act for the good of subjects and subjects in turn act for the good of the community, upholding the system which provides a framework of human action directed towards the flourishing of all. And Raz himself recognizes this, noting that under the rule of law, the interests of all the governed should be given their proper significance and importance. So this idea of equality before the law is embedded in Raz's account of the rule of law, and I think arguably also in Fuller's account of the rule of law. And once we get down the, the road of the interests of all the governed should be given their proper significance and importance, I don't think we can remain neutral on the content of law or the ends to which it should be pursued. Um, I don't think that's possible once we get to that point. So while the rule of law demands that legal officials make good faith attempts to better the lives of those under their charge, it does not on its own stipulate a full account of flourishing. I think this is important, okay? Because you could say, okay, yes, the rule of law is in some way committed towards rights protection or flourishing, but it doesn't tell us what rights. It doesn't tell us what constitutes flourishing. Um, and I think, at least in one context, you can say, well, it tells us some rights. You know, you're not, you're not permitted if you're in a rule of law society. The government is not permitted to just lock you up without trial because it doesn't like you. You have a right against that. Habeas corpus as a remedy can be given. And I think we could say similar minimum content claims about what constitutes the good. We kind of know certain things are really, really, really bad for people. And we can probably rule those out already. And we can quibble about the other stuff. So uh, a point makers, I think one must look to the other principles of a theory, a full theory of political morality to flesh out all of this. But that doesn't mean that human flourishing or indeed rights protection is not a central part of the rule of law. So Fuller rejects the contention that in order to judge what is bad in human conduct, we must know what is perfectly good. So we can know what is unsuited to an end without knowing what is perfectly suited to achieving it. So we can, for example, know that it is plainly unjust to do something without necessarily committing ourselves to declare with finality what perfect justice requires. And equally, I think uh, we can have a general sense of what is good for a given purpose without needing to stipulate in abstraction from context and circumstance what would constitute perfection in that context. So for example, and this is Fuller's uh, example, he says, you know, a carpenter's hammer can perform adequately over a wide range of tasks. It reveals its deficiencies only when we try to use it to drive in a very, very small nail or a very, very heavy tent stick. If someone asks me to hand them a hammer, I do not need to know what tool would perfectly serve their purposes in order to grasp that many tools would be useless. So I do not, for example, pass them a screwdriver or a length of rope. So we can have in some sense, a limited idea already about what the minimum content of this might mean. And this is, broadly speaking, this manifests itself in constitutional and administrative law theory by saying that public authority should be uh, directed towards a plausible conception of the public good. So what we're concerned about in administrative law when we deal with things like unreasonableness or improper purposes or constitutional proportionality analysis, we're trying to figure out what would be deeply unsuited. What are the outermost limits of the discretion that the lawgiver or the lawmaker might have? And we can do that without having to figure out inside the realm of reasonable disagreement what will be perfect to meet that. Because what will be perfect to meet the conditions of the day will depend on the conditions of the day. And they might also depend on other principles that we have relating to institutional legitimacy of who gets to make those ultimate decisions. So Fuller's use of that example, the hammer example, is used to explain how we can know the bad on the basis of very imperfect notions of what will be good to perfection. Fuller's, I think, somewhat pragmatic approach here reveals an important aspect of what he envisages law, or if we want to, the rule of law, to be for. So we should not say that a lack of a perfect conception of the good means that law is not concerned with the flourishing of persons. We know enough to create the conditions that will permit a man or a woman to lift themselves upwards 
It is certainly better to do that than to try to pin them to the wall with a perfect articulation of their highest good. So excellence in legality is thus a much more about facilitating the flourishing of legal subjects than it is about demonstrating excellence in, uh, no, as much about facilitating the flourishing of the subjects as it is about demonstrating excellence in governance. Indeed, I think it's clear that one implies and necessitates the other. So if you want to be excellent at governing, you're going to have to be good at helping people to flourish. So final point I'll make, and then I think we'll, we'll finish up. What does that tell us about Fuller's theory? Does that mean that Fuller is what you might call a classic natural law theorist? Um, or is he in this unique proceduralist account? I think you can probably see from my thoughts on this that Fuller's not concerned about form or procedure here. There's something else going on. Um, but he doesn't seem to fall into what we traditionally understand to be the, the natural law tradition. And I think part of that is because Fuller is not concerned with what you might call a purely speculative conception of, of natural law. Um, the idea that you can sit in an armchair and figure out for yourselves what's perfectly good for all of society and then impose it on the rest of the world. The problem is, most of the classic natural law tradition isn't that either. For that, you need to look at someone like Hobbes and Locke and Kant and all of the Enlightenment and post-Enlightenment thinkers who do this kind of pure speculative theory about what is perfectly good, and or at least what the abstract conditions are. Pre-Hobbes, the conception of the classical natural law tradition is not grounded in that. It's grounded in a very, very embedded practice. It's the idea that we work out these moral principles in an existing context. So although Fuller would have, I think, emph emphatically described his theory as a variety of natural law, he really was at pains to stress that the principles are not higher laws. In fact, he would prefer to refer to them as lower laws, that they set a foundational floor within which the actual moral requirements of reciprocity work themselves out. Now, my argument is that that is exactly how the classical legal tradition, the classical natural law tradition would have done as well. And I think that's embodied both in the, the Roman tradition, but also in the classic common law tradition. And that, that is distinct from more modern conceptions of natural law, which really do adopt, a, let's think about things free from a social context. Let's think of a state of nature and work out what would be natural rights within that context. The natural law tradition doesn't seem to, to do that in my view. So Fuller rejects any conception of the natural law which has advanced one or more of the following positions. So first, the notion that the demands of the natural law can be subject to an authoritative pronouncement. Secondly, the notion that there is something called the natural law, capable of concrete application like a written code. And third, the notion that there is a higher law transcending the concerns of this life against which human enactments must be measured and declared invalid in the case of conflict. Now, I think, with some exceptions, the majority of those principles, these are Hobbesian ideas of natural law. These are the, the state of nature natural law ideas. But an older way of thinking about natural law is grounded far more within a practice. It's, it's within a particular social context. So Fuller accepted that excellence in legality will demand the pursuit of what he refers to as the conditions that will permit a man to lift himself upwards. But it's worth repeating at this point that Fuller was adamant that the inner morality of law was predominantly aspirational in nature. And this means that the real concern that Fuller had with classical natural law theory was that, in his view, it purported to stipulate perfection in human endeavors abstracted from human context. And that is these purely speculative ideas. Once you're embedded within human context, I don't think Fuller has as much of a problem with the classic natural law tradition, although I think he might still have some. So the inner morality of law then um, is distinct from external morality in that it, is not, it does not direct ultimate ends. But this does not mean that it has nothing to say about the ends of law at all, nor the pursuit of human flourishing itself. So the sense of trusteeship that's embedded in the inner morality of law manifests within legal officials an attitude of respect that will necessarily lead them to pursue good faith attempts at the public good. So I'll close with just one final point, and then we can hopefully open up to questions if you have any, um, or you know, rotten fruit if you don't. Um, so final point I'll make here is that I think rule of law scholarship often focuses too heavily on the principles of the desiderata, each of these principles, um, and and too little on the background presumptions that are needed to give rise to these principles. The background presumptions that we make that give them unity and weight 
So with that in mind, however, I think a conception of the rule of law as procedural, even in this kind of special and qualified sense that Fuller used it, um, is unsustainable. There's nothing within Fuller's conception of the rule of law that's incompatible with a classic definition of law as an ordinance of reason directed towards the common good and promulgated by someone who has care for the community. Indeed, much of this definition, I think, is tacitly accepted by Fuller. So to rule by law is to attempt in good faith a particular kind of social ordering, which respects the dignity of the legal subject, and so adopts an attitude of trusteeship or custodianship, which seeks to advance their interests and to facilitate their flourishing. So I think scholars who are influenced by Fuller will be well served to abandon the fiction stressed by Fuller himself that his theory was somehow unconnected from the substantive ends of the legal system. I'll end it there.